You loved every bit of it. You loved having griffins call you a prodigy. Loved the attention you got. You have no idea how hard it was to watch you while the rest of the family pushed me aside. I looked at the arena as we walked closer to it. Aura slightly ahead of me and her sister Fletch on my other side. Only caught in a glimpse of the arena while I was here last. Before, I thought it had walls made out of sandstone, but I was wrong. The sandstone around it was just raised platforms for griffins to watch from. The arena had walls made out of scrap metal. That only went a few feet high, giving a good view into the sunken pit in the middle of it. There was a loose sand scattered around the floor of the arena, making the ground softer than the canyon's normal hard surface. It was also huge, given enough room for other griffins to fight. Griffins had already started to surround the arena, either on all sides of it or on the cliffs so they could look down on the action. At one end, there was a raised platform that overlooked the arena. As we drew closer, I looked over to Aura and asked, Do you really have to do this? I mean, who cares what the rest of the griffins think here? You're not part of the Red Talons anymore. Aura looked back at me. I care. It's not just about me, Shadow. If it was, I wouldn't be doing this. Honestly, I don't give two shits about what Fletch thinks or what she wants to do to me. I'm doing this for two reasons. First, she needs to learn her lessons, once and for all. Second, if I back down, I'll look like a coward, and that reflects badly on my family. I thought you said family's too much work, so why do you care? I asked. She sighed. Family is too much work, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't care about them. I mean, I've been enough of a disappointment to them. I put a hoof on her shoulder, stopping her. When she looked down at me, I said, Aura, you're a lot of things, but a disappointment isn't one of them. All you did was break a stupid rule of your talent company. So what? Your family might have looked bad because of it, but that's their problem, for not accepting you for who you are. From what I've seen, most of them are just trying to make up for that mistake. Hell, I'm sure that most of the griffins here don't give two shits about what you did. I think Fletch is just angry because she thinks you don't care about how she feels. Aura looked back towards the arena where Fletch was waiting. You might be right about that. I know it's hard to believe, but Fletch and I used to be close. Before I was with Tripwire, Fletch was the closest thing I had to a best friend. What happened? Aura sighed. I met Tripwire and spent less time with my sister. Over the years, she grew angrier and angrier with me till she just flat out hated me. When she found out what I was doing with Tripwire, she was disgusted with me. Fletch yelled over at us. Hurry up, Aura! Or are you thinking about backing down? Aura looked back at me and smiled. I love you, Shadow. I love you too. Are you going to be okay? I asked as she started to walk away. I'll be fine. This isn't a fight to the death or anything. I felt a hoof rub my mane a little. I looked up and saw Stardust watching her go as well. She'll be fine, Shadow. You know how good of a fighter Aura is. Fletch doesn't stand a chance. I know, but I'm not worried about her safety. I'm worried that she's going to hate herself after this. He looked confused. Why is that? Because no matter what, Aura's going to lose, even if she wins this fight. If she does win, she'll make her sister look weak in front of all the Red Talons. Fletch will have lost a fight against a disgraced griffin. If Fletch wins, Aura will have to leave her home for good and stop being a freelancer. It'll screw with her way of life, I said. I see what you mean. I mean, what will happen when this is over? He said with a sigh. Well, we can't change her mind, so all we can do is watch and hope that things work out for the best. Come on, Apollo said we could watch the fight from the platform overlooking the arena with him and Gigi. All right, I said, letting him pick me up and fly me over to the larger platform where Gigi was waiting with Apollo and my friends. When both Aura and Fletch entered, Gigi stood on her hind legs and raised her talons to the sky. Fighters! 
You have both shown your bravery by entering the arena today. Let no griffin here think that either of you are cowards. Now, as the challenger, Fletch Blood Talon, do you still wish to fight today? Fletch looked up at her mother and said, I do. Gigi looked over at Aura. Aura Blood Talon, you have been challenged to fight today in the arena, in front of the Red Talons and your family against your own flesh and blood. You have accepted by entering. But I must ask, do you still wish to flight Fletch? I do, Aura said. Gigi looked around at all the griffins, stating, Both griffins have accepted. Then she looked back at the sisters. Fletch, as this is a fight with stakes, please state what your request is if you win today. Aura has to drop the name Blood Talon and never return to our home. She disgraced our family by breaking one of the Ten Laws, the same laws laid down by Greta herself. Not only did she start a relationship with a mare, but she also let it interfere with her work as a Talon. When she was caught and banished, she still stayed with his mare until her death. Mora was left with a way to get back into our ranks. But she decided instead to find a new pony to be with, spitting on our way of life and our family's honor. When she loses today, she will no longer be part of our family. She can no longer be a freelance griffin, and she must leave our territory forever. The banishment applies to her lover and friends if she does come back. Then she will suffer death for breaking the terms set down today in this fight. Fletch said, Gigi looked sad, shaking her head, but she kept it held high as she looked over at her youngest daughter. Aura Blood Talon, do you agree with the terms set down today? If so, do you have any of your own? Only one. If I win, I want Flesh to be banished like I was from the Red Talons for a whole year. That way she'll see how hard it really is in the world, without the protection of our family. Aura said, you do realize that, Ivor, if you accept the terms of this fight, you will be banished from anywhere the Red Griffins call their territory. You can also no longer be allowed to be a freelancer griffin. This will change your life forever. You would be considered less than a griffin to all of your kind across the wasteland. With this in mind, do you still wish to proceed? Apollo said, walking over to stand next to Gigi. I do, Aura said. And yes, I agree. I felt anger building up as I looked down at her, yelling, If you lose this fight, Hora, you'll be leaving me behind as well. Gigi pushed me back, looking down and saying quietly, Shadow, you can't interfere. Trust Hora. She's right, Shadow, Stardust said, wrapping his hooves around me and pulling me into a tight hug. Hora will be just fine. Aura didn't answer me, but when I looked back at her, I saw a tear running down her face. She knew what the risk was. She knew that she couldn't lose. When I finally calmed down, Apollo looked at Fletch. Fletch, you understand that if you lose, you will be cast out of the Red Talons and unable to return home for a year. With this in mind, do you accept the terms? I do. And trust me, I won't lose. Fletch said with a smirk. Gigi spoke again. Let it be known that both parties agree. Now, as all of you know, this is a fight to prove who is the better fighter between griffins. This means that no ranged weapons are allowed. Since this is not a fight to the death, then only practice weapons are allowed. Aura, what weapon will you use to dear? As the one being challenged, you get to pick first. I'll use a long spear, Aura started to say, but Fletch cut her off. Aura, I'm not going to let you fight me unless you're at your best. I want everyone here to know that I can win against you with your best weapon, Fletch said. Aura looked over at her, then sighed. Fine, I'll use twin forward-facing Garakas. 
Fletch smiled and said, I'll use a longsword. Two griffins entered the arena with a box, as they did. I looked over at Gigi and asked, What's a Gurkha? She looked down at me and said quietly, The swords Greta used, the ones you see on her statue in the center of the canyon. Laura prefers a spear, but she's always been better with two of them. The ones she asked for. The blades turned forward, making it easier to gut and slash. It's also a very fast weapon. I watched as the box was opened, and two silver swords, shaped just like the one I had, Misery, were taken out and given to Aura. Aura took both and twirled them around in her talons a few times. Fletch took a long, slender-looking sword from the other griffin and spun it around quickly. Once both had their weapons, and the other griffins left, Gigi raised one talon to the heavens. Fighters ready? And begin! As soon as Gigi dropped her talon, Fletch attacked. She flapped her wings at the same time she jumped forward, giving her extra speed to charge Aura. That sword of hers gave her as much longer reach than the smaller ones Aura had. Aura didn't look worried at all as soon as Fletch's sword came close, Aura brought her left sword up, blocking the attack and pushing her sister's blade to one side as she brought the other blade around to slash Fletch. Fletch twisted around, following her blade around, then spinning, and trying to strike Aura's back. Aura ducked under the attack and quickly kicked back with a hind leg, catching her sister's stomach, sending her flying back into a far wall. Aura twisted around and flipped the blades around in her talons again. By now, I would have thought you'd learn to calm down in a fight, sis. But it seems you still have some learning to do. You always rush your opponent. It makes it easy to predict your moves. I'm not finished yet, Aura. That was just a warm-up. Fletch yelled as she took to the air, then dove at her sister. Aura dodged to the right, but her sister's blade changed direction and she slammed the blade down on one of Aura's wings. If the blade had been sharp, she would have cut her sister's wing off. Aura swore, then turned around and looked back at her sister. Both her blades held up, ready for another attack. As they did, Apollo lifted a talon, saying, One point to Fletch. I looked over at Gigi and asked, Point? Since this isn't a fight to the death, that means we have to take each mortal blow as a point. Ten points wins the match. As it stands, Fletch has one, Aura has zero. <laughs> nice move, sis. I guess you really have been trying to get better. Now let's see how you do when I get serious. Aura said, flipping both blades back and lunging at her sister. Fletch swiped her sword at Aura. Aura grinned and brought down both of her blades up to block Fletch. Then she parried the blow and attacked. Fletch jumped back, then slashed down. The next thing I knew, both of them were trading blows, the ringing of metal filling the air. The griffins watching them fight started to cheer for who they wanted to win. It was hard to tell whose name I heard more, Aura's or Fletch's. I always figured that Aura wasn't liked much in the Red Talons because of what she did, but from the sound of it, plenty of griffins really wanted her to win. Aura's black uh, flipped over, Fletch then stabbed down onto her, slamming her onto the ground. Apollo put a talon in the air again. One point, Aura! Both fighters started again, each attack getting wilder as the fight went on. I hadn't seen half of the attacks Aura was using to fend off Fletch. Each blow got harder, each parry getting more desperate from each side. I wasn't as skilled a fighter as Aura, but I could tell just by watching that both Aura and Fletch were almost evenly matched. Aura had more power behind her blows, and better reach because of her heavier, longer sword. Aura on the other hoof was faster and watched each movement her sister made. From what I had learned from Yaksha, Aura's fighting style was the better of the two. But also, even though Fletch's style was more straightforward, she could use it to overwhelm Aura over time. Two points, Aura! Apollo yelled as Aura slammed her sister's block to the side and pressed her other sword up to Fletch's neck. Aura pulled away with a grin. I thought you said you were going to beat me, sis. What's wrong? From what I can tell, you... Fletch moved even faster than she had before. 
her sword slamming into Ora's gut before she could even get up a proper defense. Ora looked shocked as Fletch said, Don't ever let your guard down, remember? I watched as the fight got worse. Fletch got two more points, putting them at four and two. Ora made a small comeback when she used a feint to get a nasty blow on Fletch. Each blow got worse, every hit louder. By now, they were both holding at seven and six in favor of Fletch. Every time they fight, they get like this, Gigi said. What do you mean? I asked, keeping my eyes glued on Aura as she ducked under one of Fletch's slashes as she tried to stab her in the gut, only to have Fletch twist around the stab and kick her in the face. Every time Fletch and Aura fought, they get more and more aggressive. It's rare for them to ever make it to the end without one of them getting hurt. Last time, Aura broke three of Fletch's ribs. The time before that, Fletch broke Aura's left hind leg. When they fight like this, it's life or death. Gigi said with a sigh. And this is why I didn't want them to fight. But they are my daughters, and they're all hot-headed thanks to me. I jumped as Aura and Fletch met in midair, their swords connecting and sending out such a loud bang it echoed off the canyon walls. They landed, then attacked again, only to block each other's blows. Unlike before, neither of them broke away. Instead, they tried to overpower the other. I could tell that both of them were exhausted, but neither would back down. As Aura pushed her two swords against her sister's long one, she said, What's your fucking problem, sis? What's the point behind this stupid fight? I didn't bring you here to talk, Aura. We're here to fight. Now you shut up. Fletch said, her voice shaking slightly. Aura sidestepped, twisted around, and slashed her sister's back. Fletch retaliated by looping her sword around and stabbing back into her sister's belly. As she did, I heard Apollo yell, Nine, nine! The next point earned will be the winner! Come on, Aura. You can do this. I said, watching as she panted, looking across the arena at her sister who was panting just as hard. Why do you care about proving you're such a better fighter than me? You shouldn't care one bit about if you can beat me in a fight. I'm not a red talon anymore. All you'd prove is that you're stronger than some freelancer outcast. If you really wanted to prove your strength, you'd fight V, or one of the other top fighters in the talons. This isn't about proving how strong you are. So, what's the real reason? Aura asked through her heavy breathing. You won your matches against V two years ago, Aura. You also took out Gus and Sin, as well as multiple fights back in the day, when you still cared about your family, Fletch said. It's always been about you, Aura. Every damn day of my life since you hatched. Aura the prodigy. Aura the griffin, who would one day take over as leader. Aura the poor little trick, who got to train with Gina while she was little. Aura, Aura, Aura. All the damned time, it's always about you. If I win against you, I'm proving that you aren't the best fighter in our family. Proving that I'm the one who should take over one day. She attacked again, lifting her swords into an X block as her sister started banging on her blades over and over again. I have no idea what you mean. I didn't ask to be the best fighter. I was just born with a lot of talent. Fletch screamed and slammed her sword down harder and harder with each blow, yelling, That's the problem right there. I had to work my ass off to get stronger. I spent hours every day training, learning and watching so I could reach your level. For years I stood by your side and praised you as you pushed your way higher into our ranks. I loved you. I wanted to be just like you. I wanted that raw talent you had so bad. It was so fucking sad and pathetic. You're the youngest of us. You should have been looking up to me or your other sisters. But no, you just had a gift and everyone knew it. Fletch twisted around and tried to slam her sword into her sister's side. Aura just got her sword up to block, but the blow still went skidding across the ground. When she got back up and blocked another attack by Fletch, she yelled, I did look up to you. All of you. You wanted to be like me? I hated my talent. All I wanted when I was younger was to be a medic like Sin. I looked up to her because she didn't care about how good of a fighter she was. No, she cared about helping others. 
V, I looked up to because she was a good leader and the perfect role model for me when it came to taking command. Gus wasn't strong or smart, but he was kind and caring. I looked up for him for that. And then there's you, Fletch. You have no idea how much I wish I had the ability you did to never back down from a fight. Never care about what others thought about you. You're brave, strong, and never give up. I had to become what I am because Gina saw my talent and wanted to shape it to make me a fighter. Fletch attacked again, but Aura dodged it and blew, flew to the other end of the arena. Fletch looked back at her sister, yelling, You loved every bit of it! You loved having Griffins call you a prodigy, loved the attention you got. You have no idea how hard it was to watch you while the rest of the family pushed me aside. I was always second best compared to you. Never thought twice about it, because I loved you, sis. So what did I get for having your back all those years? You betrayed us. That bitch mare came into your life and took you away from us. Ever since you met her, you did what everyone else did. Pushed me away. When she entered your life, you treated me like dirt. I, to, to, to make it even worse, you hid your feelings about her from me. I was your best friend, your biggest supporter back then. I wanted you to succeed, because if you did, then I'd be okay with you being better. And you threw it all away. You know, you could have told me and I would have kept your secret. But no, you just lied and hid. Everyone was quiet now as we all saw the same thing at the same time. Fletch was crying, tears running down her face as she held her sword up, ready for another attack. But she didn't move as she looked across the arena at Aura, who looked dumbfounded by her sister's rage. The quiet got so bad that she could have heard a pin drop. Say something! Fletch screamed. Aura hung her head and sighed letting her blades rest at her sides as she stayed standing on her hind legs. You're right. I did push you away. But not because I didn't trust you, or because I was trying to hide from you. I did it because I knew that someday, someone was going to find out about Tripwire and me. If anyone found out that you knew as well, you would have been sent away too. I didn't want that for you, Fletch. I didn't want any of my family to be brought down for what I was doing. Then why didn't you stop? She was a fucking pony. She wasn't a griffin. It's not like she was your soulmate. You just did what you always do. Push the limits on what you could get away with. You didn't care about what would happen to us, because if you did, you wouldn't have done it. Fletch screamed. You know the worst part? Even after you left, nothing changed here. It was still always about you. Dad making sure you had a way to get back into the talons. Mom keeping an eye on you. V and Sin talking behind our backs, trying to find a way to help you find a job that would prove you always belonged here. Always about precious Aura. Poor youngest daughter of the leader who made a mistake. If it was me who fucked a pony, I would have been kicked out and forgotten. I saw Gigi get up as if she was going to say something. But Apollo put a talon on her shoulder. Don't let her speak. You can't help anyway. She needs to get this off her chest. Gigi sat back down, looking at her daughters as they stood off, Fletch ready to attack, Aura looking sad and not defending herself. Aura finally looked back at her sister. You're right. I could have stopped. Tripwire wasn't my soulmate, but I thought she was back then. I was young and stupid. I fell for her because I saw something in her that I liked. She may not have been a griffin, but she did have something that intrigued me. Yes, enough to risk my life and my possession in the talons. All for fucking a mare who died because of what you did? Fletch screamed. Tell me, Aura, why didn't you come back after that, huh? You know you could have if you wanted to. Why did you spend six months alone as a freelancer, when all you had to do was come home and beg for Mom's forgiveness? It was Aura's turn to yell. Because I was ashamed. Is that what you want to hear? I was ashamed of what happened, for what I did, yes, for everything, and yes, that includes Tripwire dying. She loved me with all her heart, but deep down, I knew I didn't love her the same. It took me six months to even work up the nerve to even think about coming back. 
And that's why I stole the orders you had on you and found the courier. I was going to take the bounty and get back in, so I could try and earn everyone's forgiveness for breaking our great laws. Then why didn't you do that when you found her? Aura slashed a sword upwards in the air as she yelled. I made a mistake and got hurt. Shadow saved my life because her friend Stardust nearly caved in my side with a kick. She, if she would have left me there, I wouldn't have been able to get to a safe place. I might have died from internal bleeding, but... Aura took the blade she had up and pointed directly at me. Shadow showed me compassion and kindness. She gave me a healing potion which I was fresh out of. I did what any self-respecting griffin would have done and followed her to repay her for her kindness. Reflect sneered. And then you decided to stay with her even after you repaid your debt, because you saw a chance to have the same fun you did before with another fucking pony? It wasn't about that at all. I never saw Shadow as some pony to have fun with. Not like with Tripwire. Yes, I had fun with Tripwire for a while and thought that I loved her. But it wasn't until I met Shadow that I knew how wrong I was. Because ever since I first met her, I knew she was the one I was meant to be with. My heart skipped a beat as she said that, and I felt a tear running down my face. Fletch, however, laughed. She's a pony. You can't have those feelings for a pony. You're wrong, Fletch. You know as well as I do. A griffin's soul isn't bound to their race. Souls are not bound by gender or race. When two souls meet, they are meant to be together. It doesn't matter who they are or what they are. I love Shadow. I'd die for her. Just like I'd die for you because you're my family. And she is as well. When I look at her, I don't see a pony. And I don't see the courier mare. And when I look at her, I see the one who's the light to my darkness. That half that makes me whole. She's my life. And I'm hers. If you don't like that, then fine. I don't care, because I don't need the red talons. I don't need to be a freelancer. I don't even need my family, even if I still love all of you with all my heart. All I need is her. I don't even need this fight. And do you know why? Because I don't care if you're stronger or if I am. If you win, your stupid terms won't keep me from her. It won't bring me back to the Red Talons in the future. It'll only push me further away from you. My life isn't in this fucking canyon anymore, trying to find a way to make more caps or to become stronger. I'm a free griffin, and I always will be, no matter what you say or what you try to do, Aura said. Clutch looked lost for a moment as Aura spoke. Then she said so quietly that no one would have heard it, if it hadn't been so quiet. You'd give up everything? For her? Aura sighed. I already have. Now let's finish this, Fletch. You've said your piece, and so have I. If you really need to prove that you're the stronger griffin, then so be it. I don't care anymore. Fletch screamed again, then charged at Aura. Her long sword held high as she flew across the arena. Aura jumped into the air again and charged Fletch. Fletch looped her sword around into an uppercut slash. Aura started to bring her left sword down around a block, but then Fletch twisted around, looping her sword back the other direction, going for a downward slash instead. Aura saw this, moving her other blade up to block. Then I saw Aura change her block, letting it slip to the side of her sister's blade, giving her an opening. It was right then that I knew Aura was going to throw the match so her sister could win. She was giving her a future and happiness so her sister could have a better one. She was doing this so Fletch could finally be happy. Fletch's sword slammed down on Aura's shoulder, sending my loving, wonderful, stupid griffin slamming to the soft sand. Aura laid there moaning in pain as she held her shoulder with a talon. Fletch landing next to her, looking shocked at what had happened right as Apollo said, Ten to nine! Fletch wins! Those words felt like a knife being driven into my own heart. Because of the terms Fletch had set up if she won, Aura would be banished from the Morave. Because the Red Talon territory was huge. She'd have to stop taking contracts. She'd no longer be a normal griffin ever again. If I wanted to stay with Aura, we'd all have to leave. 
and never come back here. I'd have to say goodbye to the land I'd started to call home, give up on finding out more about the children of the night, Aquila, my mom, everything I'd been working for weeks now. All because Oral at the last attack make it through. She'd had the block. She could have used it to get her own hit in so she could win. But she hadn't. Because Aura just wanted to give something back to her sister. I felt Aura, or Stardust, pull me close again, saying quietly, It'll be okay, Shadow. We'll figure something out. I couldn't say anything back to him. I was watching as Fletch looked down at Aura, confusion written on her face. Gigi got up and said in a sad voice, The winner is Fletch Blood Talon. Aura, this means that you will have to do as was requested by Fletch. You will give up the name Blood Talon, leave our lands forever, and give up your right as a freelancer. No! I yelled, pulling out of Stardust's grasp and jumping off the platform. I ran over to where Aura was still laying on the sand, looking up at the clouds as tears ran down my face. I moved in front of Fletch, saying, You can't do this to her, Fletch! I know you don't approve of Aura's way of life, but you can't just make her leave everything she's known for her whole life just because you're angry. Fletch looked over at me, but she didn't look angry anymore. She looked sad. She knew what she was getting herself into and she accepted. Horse apples. Aura only does for you. Can't you see that? She's risking everything so you can feel better about yourself. She cares about you so much that she's willing to give up even me so you can be happy. I yelled. If that's not a good enough reason to take back your terms, then how about this? I'll fight you here and now. If I win, you take back everything you said. I'm not going to let her be forced to leave over you. Gigi landed next to me, put a talon on my shoulder trying to pull me away. Shadow, it's done. You can't change that. I pulled away, then took hold of both blades or had been using with my magic and pointed them at Fletch. Fight me! Step aside, courier. Fletch said, lifting her sword a little. Never. Fletch sighed and said a word I thought I'd never hear come from her beak. Please. Not knowing why, I backed up a little, but I was now standing on the other side of Aura. She looked up at me and said in a tired voice, I'm sorry, but I had to do it. I didn't get a chance to answer as Fletch knelt next to Aura and quietly asked, Why did you do it? Aura chuckled, then winced in pain. Do what? Still keeping quiet so no one could hear Fletch. You had that block. I saw it. You could have easily taken the last point for yourself, but instead you let me win. How would you do that? To show other griffins that you had to give me a victory? Laura looked up at her sister again. Because no matter what, no matter where I go or what I have to do, Shadow will still stay with me, and that's all I need in my life. You, however, needed this win. You can't handle being alone. Trust me, sis. It's not that easy. All you did was show that you're still better. Fletch. Why can't you see what I see, huh? I'm only better than you because of things I learned outside Crimson Canyon. The Wasteland made me a better fighter than I already was before. I'm still better than you, but not by a lot. If I stayed here, you would have ended up being better than me by now. Because you care about how strong you are and I don't. All I ask is that once I'm gone for good, you'll try to calm down. You need more control and be happy. If you do that, then I can handle losing today. You need to stop living in my shadow and come out into the light so everyone can see how wonderful you are. Fletch got back up, then looked at her mom, who was still standing a few feet back. I'd like to retract my earlier terms and only ask for one thing. And that is, if Aura will agree... Gigi looked shocked for a moment, then said, You may, but only if Aura agrees to your new terms. I saw another tear run down Fletch's face as she spoke. 
And all I ask is that Aura gives up her right to ever rejoin the Red Talons. I still believe that she's no longer worthy of being one of us, but I'd like her to still come see us as much as she wants. Not as a banished griffin, but as a Talon of her own small group. I don't want to see, not see my little sister, ever again. Or I got to her talons. I'll accept. Since you won, I'll give up my rights to ever join in the red talons again. And to mine, and I think everyone's amazement, Fletch and Aura hugged, both dropping their weapons as they broke down. Logged back over to Gigi, asking, What the hell just happened? Gigi smiled, saying, Sometimes the only way you can fix something that's been broken is by fighting it out. How does fighting fix something? I asked. She looked down at me, smiling. You're still young and inexperienced with real life. One day you'll understand. She walked forward as Fletch and Aura separated. Gigi took one of Fletch's talons in the air, saying, The winner is Fletch. Let it be known that as of today she is shown to be stronger than Aura. Fletch was taken back by her early request in the terms of the duel, with Aura agreeing to come to a new agreement. Aura Blood Talon has lost her right to ever rejoin our company. Therefore, as leader of the Red Talons, I have decided that since Aura has given up her rights to ever become a Red Talon again, she is no longer banished from Crimson Canyon. I now recognize Aura Blood Talon as a separate Talon company. Aura and her team have full rights, as all Talon groups that we work with do. Visiting rights and interterritorial workings. The sounds of cheers were deafening. The griffins and ponies from Cartwheel were screaming, cheering, and applauding in approval of Gigi's announcement. I looked back at Aura, who looked like somebody who just slapped her. She looked over at her mother and asked, I'm not banished anymore? The cheers started to die down as Gigi lifted a talon. She said, Aura, my daughter, as everyone here knows, you broke one of our laws. Rule 7, which states that the griffins of the Red Talons may not be in any kind of relationship with a pony unless that relationship is friendship or as a contract broker. You broke this by being with Pony Tripwire. I think it's Rule 7 is unfair, but... I can't change that rule without agreement for most of the griffins that are part of the Red Talons. You paid the price for what you did, and still are in the same way. But since you no longer can rejoin the Red Talons, then you can no longer be held down by its rules. We do not force our way of life onto the Talon groups, as you well know. That means that you may pursue a relationship with any griffin or pony as you see fit. We will no longer force you to be something that you're not. With that said, welcome home, Gigi said, hugging her youngest daughter, something I'm sure she'd wanted to do for a very long time. Aura hugged her back. The cheering started up again, and it took a lot longer to die down. After some time had passed, and Aura was finally able to make it past the griffins who rushed into the area to congratulate her and Fletch for the amazing fight, she came up and hugged me tight. I can't believe that worked out so well. I wasn't expecting Mom or Fletch to do this for me. The rest of our friends had joined us just outside the arena, alone with Vervain, Gigi, and Fletch. Vervain, smiling, saying to Aura, I'm sure your mother has been trying to find a way to let you come home for a while now. Gigi smiled. As I told you when we talked the other day, Aura, I never wanted to send you away. Being the leader is hard. I had to do what I had to do. But I've always wanted you to come home. And just not as a part of the Red Talons. Fletch was still wiping her eyes a little as she said, I'm really sorry for making such a fuss over you leaving Aura, and for treating your friends so badly. Even if you are my youngest sister, you still proved you were stronger than I. Aura laughed. Don't worry, sis. I'll pay you back for that later. For now, I'd like to talk with you more and hear what I've missed in the past few months. Fletch looked up at her and said, I have time now. 
And that is if you can get away for a little while. Or looked at Wingnut and shrugged. I'll be fine. Shadow and I wanted to talk to that old Griffin Tonto. I nodded my head. I've been wanting to talk to him about a few things, and for a while now, I wanted to show him this. I pulled out Misery. Gigi saw the blade as I slipped it out of my saddlebags and took a step back, her eyes wide as saucers. Shadow Star, where in Equus did you find that? In the absent ruins near the kingdom, I think Greta left it with a friend of hers. I said, Did you find Joy as well? No, I didn't see it there. I was being attacked by Wrath at the time, so I may have just missed it when I was there. Or Greta still had it with her. I've been meaning to look into it more when I had the time. I learned a little about her recently, and I know how important it is to your family. Once I talked to Tonto, I wanted to give this back to you. I said, slipping the sword away. Her eyes were still wide, as she said. In all my life, I never thought I'd see even one of my great-grandmother's swords. Shadow, you have no idea how much it means to my family and the red talents that you found that. I agree. You should go talk with Tonto and show it to him. He will know what is best for what should be done with misery. Vivi had walked over as well, and while I was showing misery to Gigi, once her mother had stopped speaking, she said, Good luck finding him. He wasn't in his cave earlier, and I didn't see him during the fight. Vervain said, He was in the town we are using now, helping some of the others cleaning up. When I left to watch the fight, he said he'd stay behind to oversee things. I guess we'll head that way then, I said, looking over to Bite, Stardust, and Wind Thrasher. You three want to come? Nah, I've been wanting to check this place out. I wasn't with you all when we were here last, and I've heard so many stories about this place, Stardust said. I'll stay with Stardust. I also want to look around more and talk to Gigi later to see if she found out any more about that bounty on me, when Thrasher said. Gigi seemed to perk up. Oh, yes, I have some information. It's in the den at the moment. Just stop by later when you two are done looking around. They both nodded. As they did, Bite yawned. I guess I'll go with you, Shadow. Rusty wanted me to stay on your side when you could. So I'd rather meet some of the old griffin than hang around this old place. Wingnut seemed to sag a little as she said that. Damn it. I was hoping she'd stay behind. She glared over at him. What was that, bug? Stop calling me that! Wingnut yelled. Bug, 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 bug! Bite yelled back. Before I could stop them, Wingnut and Bite were both wrestling with each other. I was about to step in when Vervain walked over in front of the twirling mess of Colt and Philly. She cleared her throat and said in a commanding voice, Both of you, stop that right now! Oh shit, those two are about to find out first who, why you don't act that way in front of Auntie Vervain. Both of them stopped what they were doing in mid-struggle, both looking up at Vervain. Bite had one of Wingnut's ears in her muzzle, a hoof wrapped around his neck, the other one of of his rear legs trapped between her own. Wingnut was wincing as he held on to her, trying to make her get off. Both of you, let go of each other and stand up straight, she said, both of them looking up at the older mare. Much better. Now, tell me why you're both acting like this. She started it, Wingnut said, pointing a hoof at Bite. Did not, Bite retorted. Vervain looked at Bite and asked, What's your name, young man? Bite. Cookie Bite, I mean. Vervain lifted an eyebrow. Cookie Bite. Ma'am, speak to me with respect, young man. Bite's eyes narrowed a little. Why? You aren't my mom. I chuckled a little. No, but Vervain here is like a mother to me, and she's the one who raised me. You were put under my care by Rusty, and he told you to listen to me. That means you should also listen to Vervain as well. Trust me, you don't want to get on her bad side. She'll mess up your shit. Vervain looked over at me. Sit down and shut up, Shadow. 
I sat. Yes, ma'am. Bite and Wingnut started to chuckle a little until Vervain looked back at them. I'm waiting. Bite hung her head a little. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am. Much better. Now, let's try this again. Why were you two fighting like foals? Bite looked over at Wingnut, then back at her hooves. He made me mad because he doesn't want me to be around. And that's because you're mean? Wingnut said. I... I don't want to be mean. Bite said when she looked down. You still didn't have to say that, though. You're the only pony my age, apart from Shadow, and she's more of an adult than a filly like me. Ravane looked over at Wingnut. Wingnut, you really shouldn't act so coldly to Cookie Bite. From what I can tell, she's away from home for the first time. She may have an attitude problem, but that doesn't give you the right to say hurtful things. Then she looked back at Bite. Cookie Bite, I don't care what Wingnut said. You look like you're the older one here, and you should set a better example. You shouldn't go around calling him or any other pony a bug. But... Bite started to say, but she was cut off by Vervain. No buts, young filly. In the short amount of time I've seen you, I'm guessing you haven't had a parent around to keep you in line for most of your life. She shook her head. I've only got my uncle. He's always too busy with running Troston. So I keep to myself mostly with my tinkering and gadgeteering to keep me busy. I see. And I know you haven't had any adults to help you keep your own attitude problems, Wingnut. So, while you're both here, I'm going to try and fix some of what's wrong with both of you. Starting with this. I want you both to say that you're sorry to each other. They both looked at each other, then said, Sorry. Now, was that so hard? She reached into her saddlebags and pulled out a set of hoof cuffs with a long chain between each cuff. She moved forward and put a cuff on Bite's left foreleg and the other on Wingnut's right. Until tomorrow morning, you're both suck with each other. I don't want to hear about either of you starting something with the other. If you do, your punishments will be worse. Do I make myself clear? They both said, Yes, ma'am. Good. Now you may continue on with Shadow. She said, smiling and walking back towards me. Giggy and the others had been watching. Once Vervain had finished, she said, Damn, Vervain, how'd you do that? She grinned and looked back to the white griffin. Easy. I raised Shadow. She was a nightmare to deal with when she was younger, too. I laughed. Yeah, but I mostly got into fights, not arguments. Yes, you did. And you snuck into the Overmare's office eight times, stole from the kitchens more times than I can count, glued your teacher's rear to her seat seven times, and much, much more. She said with a huge smile. I blushed, then laughed too. You'd think that she'd learned to look before she sat after the third time. That's what I told her, Ravain said. Well, shall we head over to the town? I'm sure a few ponies there would love to see you. Yeah, just let me say goodbye to Aura, I said, walking over to her. She was still waiting with Fletch. You gonna be okay while I'm with my sister? I'll be fine. Where do you want to meet up? She pointed towards the caves that were over the large hut that made up the den. The last one on the right is where I used to live when I was a Talon. I'm sure it's big enough for all of us. Sounds good to me. So, what are you two going to talk about? I asked. Aura smiled and looked over at Gigi. Well, I have an idea for tomorrow. I wanted to see if Mom would let me do. But now that Fletch and I are on better terms, I have an even better idea. That is, if my sisters and Mom are okay with it. Gigi, Fletch, and V were looking at her confused. Gigi asking, What idea is that? I'll tell you when we're alone. I don't want to ruin the surprise for the others. Aura said as she looked excited. Gigi smiled a little. Sounds fair. Let's head to the den, and we can talk there. Works for me, Aura said, turning back to me and hugging me. And I'll see you tonight, okay? I look forward to it, I said, turning to follow Vervain out of the canyon. 
As I did, Sin flew over me and landed next to her sisters. As I walked away, I heard her saying to Fletch and Aura, I swear, every time you two get into a fight, you both end up with loads of injuries. If either of you broke the other's bones this time, I'm going to break the other's bones. Let's go before we have another sister fight to break up, I laughed. With that, Vervain led Bite, Wingnut, and myself out of the canyon. Windthrasher and Stardust flew off to explore as we walked away. While we walked, I asked Vervain, So, how are the survivors doing? Quite well. The trip wasn't that bad, though I think that was because we had a lot of help from the Red Talons. They kept us guarded the entire trip. The main problem we're having right now is cleaning up the sandstone ruins. Most of the buildings are intact, but there's a lot of mess and rot to clean up. I think the ponies from Cartwheel want to try and make this town a new home, she said. They don't want to go back to Cartwheel? Wingnut asked, then almost tripped as Bite walked a little too far away from him. Hey, Bite, don't do that. She looked back at him. Then keep up, Wingnut. Vervain glared at them again, making Bite slow a little so Wingnut could catch up to her before saying, Cartwheel will take a lot of time and skill to fix. Honestly, I think the real reason they don't want to go back is because my father is gone. He was the life and soul of Cartwheel. With him gone, it's not the same place, even if the buildings were still standing. I guess I can understand that. Personally, I don't really want to go back there either. Too many painful memories. I said. Vervain gave me a knowing smile. I understand where you're coming from, Shadow. Aura told me about Silver when you were training with Yaksha and the Stranger. I remember when you first met her so many years ago. I think she was your first friend in the Wasteland. I'm sure with the memories of her, my father, and what you did to your mother while you were there is too much. Wingnut finally cut up to Bite and Vervain. He looked up at her and said, Oh. You don't have to call him the stranger anymore, Vervain. We found out who he is the other day. He's Shadow's father, Nightshade. I face hoofed. Wingnut! What? He is? Wait a second. Isn't Nightshade the stallion who took over the council recently? Bite asked. You mean, he's your dad? Your enclave, Shadow? How do you know who he was? I asked Bite. She smiled. Rusty keeps up on all the politics going on around us. That includes Enclave politics. I was born in the Enclave, but I'm not Enclave. Mom left it a long time ago. I said before looking over at Wingnut. And the stranger's identity was supposed to stay a secret, Wingnut. I glared at him. He just shrugged. It's not like you're gonna run into the Enclave here. You'd know who he was. Still, we need to be careful talking about him like this. When you are entrusted with another's secret, you need to keep it. Isn't that right, Auntie Vervain? Then I looked around. Vervain? Looking back down the road, I saw that she'd stopped. Did you say Nightshade? Trotting back towards her, I said, Yeah? Why? But... He's your father's best friend. And that's what Grimm told me. I sighed. Yeah, she lied. I also don't know why you're surprised. She took a deep breath and let it out slowly. It's not easy to hear all the lies your best friend told you over the years. Sometimes I wonder if Grimm was ever really my friend at all. Maybe I was just a mare she knew she could trust with her daughter when she had to leave. I put so much faith in her mission and her friendship that I gave up twelve years of my life for her. Now I'm getting old. I have no stallion to go home to, no children, no work, and nothing to show for all the years I spent helping Grimm. All of those years spent wasting for a few lies. I put a hoof on hers and looked into her eyes. Auntie Vervain, she may have lied to you about what she was doing and who my father was. I'm sure she told you a hundred lies as well just to keep her true motive safe. But you didn't waste your years running away or for anything. You may not have had a stallion in your life. So what? You have a lot of ponies that care about you. As for a foal, that's a lie. You have me. Grim may be my mother, but you raised me. 
taught me how to be a good mare and how they should live. I'm your daughter in all but blood. As for work, you have the ponies a cartwheel to help. You have to become a leader to them, and before you were that mare who kept Stable 28 running. You've done a lot of good things in the years you spent helping Mom. I'm living proof of that. If it wasn't for all the lessons I learned from you, I wouldn't have ever made it this far. So, forget about the lies Mom's told you. Forget about the pain and hurt, and start looking for the good things. She smiled softly. When did you get so smart and wise, dear? I hugged her. I had a good teacher. Bite yawned, saying, Boring. Are you two done yet? Ravane pulled away from me, looking over at Bite. You know, I think this one's going to be a hoofful. I just rolled my eyes. Yep, I've learned that if you just ignore her, it makes life easier. Plus, she hates it more than anything. Bite stuck her tongue out at me. Hey, Shadow, stop acting like you're all wise and shit. You're way too short to be playing at being an adult. I just walked past her with Vervain following. You know, it's funny. I swear I almost heard something like a bug. Wingnut chuckled to himself, walking past Bite as she yelled, Don't call me a bug! You're a bug! Hey, I'm talking to you! Vervain looked around. I know, I think what you mean. It has a high-pitched, annoying tone to it as well. We really should talk to the Red Talons about getting some pony out here to rid the ruins of them. Bite screamed, but they didn't say anything else as she followed Wingnut. When we finally made it to the other side of the entrance that led in and out of Crimson Canyon, I looked back at Bite, who was looking down at her hooves. Her ears were down and her tail dragging on the ground. I smiled and looked away. In that moment, I realized I learned something. You didn't always have to yell or make yourself heard to win an argument. Sometimes you just needed to ignore the other pony altogether. Either way, one of the ponies would give in. Luckily, Bite was the one who did. When we reached the first house just outside of the canyon, Vervain looked towards Bite and Wingnut and asked the young filly, Tell me, Bite, did you learn anything on our walk? For a moment, she looked ready to say something rude. Then her face fell. Yes, ma'am. It doesn't feel good when some pony calls you a name like Bug. Even if you didn't mean it to be a bad thing, it can still hurt when you say it a certain way. Very good. Now are you going to think before you speak in the future? Vervain asked. Yes, ma'am. Bite said, looking up again and then letting her eyes fall on Wingnut, then myself. I'm sorry I called you a bug and yelled at you, Wingnut. I'm also sorry for being such a bitch, Shadow. Vervain looked at Wingnut. Did you learn something, Wingnut? He smiled. Yeah, Bite doesn't like being ignored. Vervain gave him a brain duster. I guess not. He rubbed his head as Bite did her best to hide her giggling. Hey, what was that for? Trying to knock some sense into you. Now, tell me if you really learned something. If not, I'm going to leave you two chained together all night and you'll be staying with me until I say otherwise, she said. Fine, Wingnut replied. I should take others' feelings into consideration, especially when it's ponies I'm traveling with. Happy now? She looked at them both for a long moment. I'm still not convinced, Wingnut. Seriously? Vervain, you're so cruel. And that's Miss Vervain, or ma'am, to you, young colt. Convince me that you learned something. Yes, ma'am, Wingnut said, crossing his hooves. He thought for a moment. His look changed. I learned that it's easy to hurt a pony's feelings when it's not meant to. To be more careful with what to say to another pony and be respectful towards them. Ravane smiled. Very good. I'm still not taking the cuffs off, though. Not until after Shadow's done meeting Tonto. They both stomped a hoof, saying, Damn! I just chuckled, then looked around for the old griffin. He wasn't hard to spot. He was in the middle of the road, talking with one of the ponies from Cartwheel. Figuring Wingnut and Bite would be fine with Vervain, <clears throat> I headed towards him. Hey, Tonto. He looked over at me and gave me a soft smile. Good evening, Curia Shadow. I'm very happy to see you again. Same here, 
So how's the restoration for the sandstone ruins? I asked. Very well, I'd say. The buildings around here are mostly dirty. Some are rotting away, others falling apart. But with so little ponies making it through the attack on Cartwheel, there's more than enough space here for them. The ones that made it have worked hard to fix this place up over the past few days. If you would like to help contribute to the restoration of this place, I'm sure the ponies here would be very appreciative, he said. So, how can I help you? I'd be happy to help out now and again. But for now, I pulled out Misery with my magic and showed it to him. I found this in the absent ruins. Both Gigi and Aura said I should bring it to you. They both think it's... He reached out and took the sword with trembling talons. Misery. In all my years, I never thought I'd see this beautiful weapon return home to Crimson Canyon. I hoped that one day Joy would make it back here. But never this one. Why do you think Joy would have been found and not Misery? I asked. Because Greta still had Joy when she left to follow the Pegasus she was helping. From what I know about her son, he said that Misery was stolen by that Pegasus. We never knew what happened to him. But Greta, I know, was last spotted in the Crystal Empire before she vanished from the face of Equus. I always figured that the Enclave had Joy and they might for all I know. I believe that if she was killed, then she went there. Absent Moon, however, the Pegasus that stole Misery, we never heard from again. He looked closer as he looked at the blade. I pulled the letter I found with Misery. He didn't steal it. Greta gave it to him. The absent ruins outside the kingdom were named after him, and I think he died there or close by. He must have known that Greta was following him, because he left this for her in a building, along with a memory orb. He took the letter and read it quickly. I see. It's strange that she'd give misery to him like that. From this letter, it seems that they were very close. But I don't see how that could be. The only pony, Griffin, uh, Greta, knew so well was Nightstalker. And they never spoke again after she left the Enclave and started the Red Talons. Getting closer to him so no pony could overhear, I whispered, Absent Moon was Nightstalker. That's his real name. From what I can tell, once he became a Dashite, he started using it again so no pony or griffin would know who he was. Tonto smiled, then chuckled. Well, that would explain a lot. I didn't know why, I never knew. Maybe because we don't have much information on what happened during those times. Absent Moon stayed in Crimson Canyon for four months while he healed. He never let anyone get pictures of him, and he didn't talk to many of the griffins here. Grey, who was Greta's only child, didn't like him at all. I'm just glad I was able to get this back to where it belongs. Misery has served me well over the past few days. Wingnut finally caught up with Bite not far behind. Yeah, she killed a couple Steel Rangers with it. Tonto looked at the blade again. Tell me, Shadow, do you know the history behind Joy and Misery? I shrugged. No, I don't, apart from that they used to belong to Greta, and I believe I heard that Night Stalker gave them to her? That's kind of a strange gift to give some pony, or griffin, whatever, Bite said. Tonto looked down at her, then showed her the sword. Tell me, young one, does this sword look normal to you? Shook closer at it, and her eyes went wide. No, it doesn't. What kind of metal is that? The base of the blade itself is one of the hardest metals on Equus. That, however, didn't make it special. No, that's the spells that were put on it as it was being made, and the edge of the blade itself, which is made from star metal. This makes it so that the blade can cut through almost anything. Tonto said, pointing the tip down and pressing hard into the ground. Misery sank into it like butter. Bite watched, saying, Wow, that's so cool. Shadow, how'd you end up with such a cool weapon? I shrugged. I have a knack for finding strange weaponry. Anyway, Tonto, I wanted to give this back to the Red Talons, since it belongs to you anyway. He looked back at me, pulled Misery out of the ground. Why would you want to do that? If Misery stayed here, it would just sit on the wall of my cave or in the den collecting dust. No, that's not right. This weapon was made for killing. 
I want you to keep it, Shadow. It'll serve you better than me. I took the sword back, asking, Are you sure? I mean, this belongs with the red talons, not me. He started to laugh. It belongs to a descendant of the Children of the Night. From what I heard, you were descended from Annette. You see Night Stalker commissioned a sword for his best friend after the Battle of Las Pegasus. Manette was the mayor who helped place the spells on this sword while it was being forged. I believe that this sword was meant to be found by you. All I ask is that you take good care of it. I slid the sword back into my bags. I'll take good care of it, Tonto. Thank you. He smiled. No, Shadow. Thank you for showing it to me. Tonto, what else do you know about the Children of the Night and Greta? I asked. He chuckled. I know a great deal. I have an idea. How about you three come back to my cave and I can answer anything you want to know? That is, if Vervain doesn't need me anymore. Vervain laughed. We'll be fine, Tonto. You've done enough today. Tonto smiled. Well then, let's go. Tonto, as much as I'd love to sit and talk with you, I want to relax before everything starts. I said. I understand, Shadow. You go rest up. I can look after the foals for a while. That is, if they want to see an old griffin's cave full of old world tech and listen to his stories. Tonto said. Old tech? Bite said, jumping up and down. How old? Wingnut said, jumping up and down as well. Follow me, children. While we walk, I'll tell you the story of how we settled in the Crimson Canyon, Tonto said as he walked off with the two foals. Vervain laughed. Funny how they both seem to have forgotten about the cuffs holding them together. Nah, those two both seem to forget about everything when tech comes into play. Well, sweetie, I need to help the ponies here finish up more work. I'll give the key to their cuffs, take them off, and they fall asleep tonight. That is, if they stay good, Vervain said, giving me a small key. I hugged her. It's good to see you again, Auntie. Have a good night. You too, sweetie. Love you, Auntie. The cave Aura used to live in was quite large. It had been set up with three rooms set off the main chamber. Even though Aura's been gone for eight months now, the cave was still set up for a griffin to live in. Either they set it up for guests after she was banished, or Gigi couldn't find it in herself to take down Aura's place. I made my way over to the larger of the rooms set off from the main room, where a bed was set up. On the nightstand next to it, there was a picture with five griffins in it. Laying down on the bed, I looked over the picture. It was Aura and her siblings when they were all a lot younger. I sighed and lifted the Mark II in front of me, staring to look through the files on it. Mom's files regarding stargazers seemed to go on forever. I started to look through them, but it seemed like a hopeless task. Each file I tried to read mostly resolved around what she was able to find regarding the project itself. A few times I saw files mixed in regarding Project Aquila. Mom must have thought it was a different project when she first started looking into it. Later, she must have realized that they were the same thing. Even the stuff I could understand was things I already knew. Aquila was a power created by the Children of the Night in a hope to give Luna the power of Nightmare Moon again without turning her back into the Queen of the Night. Every file ended with the project being a failure. I can understand now why Mom didn't know what would happen when she found the project. All these notes and information she was able to find about Stargazer listed the power as a creation. Aquila wasn't a creation. She was a living being from beyond Equus. It was like magic but also had her own mind, feelings, and power. Mom's attempts to save me were, in reality, a curse. I backed out of her notes about Stargazer and moved into what she had on Falling Shadows. Sadly, it wasn't much. The most she heard about it was that it was the second project started by Minette to recreate what they did with Stargazer. The difference was that Aquila's power was needed to fully activate the second project. There was also notes about there being four points in Equus, that Falling Shadows was a part of. Those points were New Pegasus, the Crystal Empire, Baltimore, and somewhere near the Badlands. 
nothing in the notes said exactly what the projects did or why it was named Falling Shadows. Some of her notes speculated it was a super weapon of some kind. Others said it was meant to make Celestia or Luna more powerful or any alicorn that it was used on. The last was said that it would give great power to whomever it was used on. Mom wasn't looking into it for power, though. She figured that if she found it and activated it, she could use it to pull Aquila out of me. She wanted to use it to keep me alive and get rid of Aquila for good. That became even more apparent when I read the last of her notes about Falling Shadows. Looking into the files I found of the project, I figured out a few things about how I can use it to keep Shadow alive, and rid ourselves of Aquila at the same time. Everything I've seen shows that her power is necessary to make the project work. There are only a few things standing in my way, however. First of all, I need to get into the Lucky Horseshoe, and use the Mark II to remove the lock Sweetie Belle put in the tower. Second, I need to find out how to... what happened to the project in the Crystal Empire. And that task will be the hardest, I think. From what I've found, some pony did something to block the tower there. That even if I unlock the tower from New Pegasus, Falling Shadows can't be used. Last, I can't do anything until Shadow's older. She needs to get stronger while being able to handle the power required to remove Aquila. I'll need to risk her getting her memories and power back. It's the only way she'll live through what needs to be done. My time is limited in this stable, and I can't risk bringing her with me. If I do, she'll be used as a pawn to control what I do by either the Steel Rangers, the Enclave, or the Director herself. I have a plan. It's risky, but it should work if I set everything up right. Shadow will need to stay here in Stable 28 until she becomes of age in the stable. That should be one week before they do the Pip Buck ceremony. I'll be setting up spells that draw her to the Mark II the night before the ceremony happens. This will ensure that she has to leave the stable and head to Cartwheel like I've discussed with Vervain. That is what I'm worried about her. The best way to get her stronger is to travel the wasteland looking for me. If I know my daughter as well as I think I do, She'll be able to handle the trials I've set up for her. Once she does find me, she should be strong enough to deal with what has to be done. That is, if Aquila doesn't get free first or Nightshade doesn't get in my way. Once Aquila is out of her, I should be able to overload the project and destroy it, putting an end to Nightstalker's plans and Aquila once and for all. Then finally, I'll be able to go home and hopefully find forgiveness from Nightshade and my daughter. If not, at least she'll be safe. I've risked everything I have and everything I am for her, for my only child, my beautiful little star. I can't fail. I just can't because if I do, everything will be lost. She's the only pony who can fix the mess I've started. I closed the notes and sighed. Are you just lucky, Mom, or could you really predict everything perfectly? What I don't understand is why this mattered to you so much. I know you're only daughter, but why risk so much? I sighed and decided that I wasn't worth worrying about right now. I wasn't going to figure out Mom's motives anyway. As Aura would put it, it doesn't matter, and you shouldn't worry too much. She'd be right, too. Why did I care so much about what Mom wanted when she couldn't remember any of it right now anyway? Really, the only thing that was of any use to me at the moment was the information about how I could get rid of Aquila. The problem was that only Mom knew how she could do it. Unless, what if she left information in this shack? she was living in a few months ago, before she lost her memories. I'll have to look into it soon. Right now, all I wanted was to do sleep, so I could enjoy my time here with my friends and Dora. Tomorrow's another day, I said as I laid my head down to sleep. What felt like seconds later, I was woken up by Windthrasher, who was slowly shaking me. Shadow, it's time to get up. The opening ceremony is about to start. Dora said I should come and get you. I yawned. What time is it? Half an hour to midnight. She said the rebirth celebration starts at the beginning of the new day. We should have just enough time to get re ready before it starts. She said as I slowly got up. Can't I sleep a little longer? It only takes me a minute or two to get into my barding. I know. But Ora said you should dress up for this. You still have that dress Sheena gave you, right? Windthrasher asked. It was just then that I noticed that she was already dressed in a nicer outfit, similar to that which she wore during the ball in the kingdom. Fine. I just hate wearing dresses. 
I said, pulling my saddlebags closer and looking through them to find the silvery dress Sheena gave me. I don't know why. I mean, you look really pretty in one. So what? I don't need to look pretty. I mean, you don't need to look cute because you're already cute to begin with. Ah, oh my gosh, Shadow, shut up. She blushed. And besides, don't you want to look pretty for Aura? She said, giving me a toothy smile. I couldn't help but laugh a little. Fair point. I heard a snore and looked to the other side of the bed, and I saw Wingnut and Bite were passed out there. Windthrasher chuckled to herself. They both wanted to be close to you, I think. They got back an hour ago, and since they couldn't get free of those cuffs, they decided to stay near you so they wouldn't get into trouble. Bite was nuzzling up against Wingnut with her head against his chest, curled up into a ball. Wingnut had one foreleg over her like he was protecting her as she slept. I couldn't help but smile. Those two are cute when they aren't fighting. I agree. I think they make a good match, even if they are both young. I think that if we let them alone for a while and stop teasing them, they'd start to show each other how they feel. Ah, But it's so much fun to tease them about liking another. I said as I slipped the dress on. True. But you should also want to see what happens. Don't embarrass them anymore, okay? She said. I guess I can do that. I kind of understand. She poked my nose with a hoof. You should understand. I mean, how would you feel if everybody made fun of you for being with a griffin? I wouldn't like it at all. And I would likely have tried to hide how I felt so the others would stop making fun of me. And that's right. I looked over at her and gave her an evil smile. You should take your own advice sometimes, Windthrasher. She blushed. What do you mean? Don't worry about what others think about you. If you like Stardust, then tell him. She looked away, blushing harder. I said we aren't talking about this anymore. I'll tell him if I know he likes me the same way. I jumped on her back, knocking her to the ground as I hugged her from behind. If you say so. That just means that I have to work on Stardust so he sees how amazing you are. No, don't do that. She begged. I jumped off her, moving towards the sleeping colt and filly. Sorry, Windthrasher, but that's what friends do. They help you when you're too scared to do something for yourself. I pulled the key out of my saddlebags, which were still on the bed, and unlocked the hoof cuffs for a wingnut and bite. Bite twitched in her sleep, then nuzzled closer to wingnut as I pulled the cuffs off. Windthrasher just watched me, saying, You know I really can't wait to see what happens when they wake up like that. Also... You're not being fair. I don't want you to tell Stardust anything. I'll talk to him when I'm ready. You'll never be ready, Windthrasher. But I'm not going to tell him that you like him. I'm just going to see if he feels the same way by talking to him a little. You'd be surprised what I can figure out with a few simple and harmless questions. I said as I walked past her. Come on. We shouldn't be late. We'll let those two sleep. She just sighed. Fine. You're impossible sometimes, Shadow, but I trust you on this. When we walked out of the cave, I stopped, my eyes going wide as I saw the griffins were able to do in the next two hours. A stage was set up not far from the arena. Griffins and ponies from Cartwheel were starting to gather in front of it. All around Crimson Canyon, as far as the eye could see, sparkling colored lights were set up. They looked like small gems that had been hung from the balconies of each griffin's home on the cliff sides. There were lights on the roofs of the huts, Lights along the canyon walls, and even at the tips of the swords on the statues of Greta. The statue itself had lights set under it while illuminating the statue, so that no matter where you were, you'd see it. The wall behind the statue, where the Ten Laws of the Red Talon stood, had been left in darkness so that the rules couldn't be read. The wonders went on, however, because as I started to walk down the path that would lead Windthrasher and myself back to the den, I saw griffins dressed up in all kinds of things. I saw a group of griffins in a group, all wearing shiny leather vests. Bright pink feathers were set into their headbands around their heads, and all the tips of each feather wing matched the headdress. One griffin who flew over me was dressed in an old tux that went well with his smoky gray and white coat and feathers. I saw two griffins who had to be twins wearing matching dresses that made them look like they came from royalty. As I walked, the colors of each griffin and their outfits started to mix together, 
till I felt as if I walked into a sea of rainbows. Then I noticed that a lot of the griffins had armbands with different symbols on them, identifying them as belonging to another talon company. The red talons were the most common, but I saw at least ten others as well. I only saw a few I didn't have anything on them, to show that they were a talent company would belong to. I took that to mean that they were either freelancers or were kicked out of their own talent company and wanted to join the Red Talons. There has to be 500 griffins here, I said as Windthrasher and I got closer to the stage where I could see Gigi standing. She was wearing a red leather vest with a gold choker around her neck. The Red Talon symbol on the left side of her chest, and on the other side of the vest there was a symbol I'd never seen before. It was two crossed swords inside a set of griffin wings, with the letters RTL on it. Windthrasher had her ears folded back. I think it's closer to 600, and it's loud here. I think your hearing's too good for this kind of thing, I teased. It's a blessing and a curse, she said with a laugh. I'll get used to it, though. We should find Aura. She said to meet her by the stage. I wonder what that patch on Gigi's vest means, I said as we pushed our way past Griffins and a couple of cartwheel ponies so we could get to the front. I got my answer right away because Cindy moved closer, saying, That's Mom's rank as the leader of the Red Talons. She only wears that when we do the rebirth celebration, or if she's meeting an important client. Oh, I guess that makes sense. So, Sin, where's Aura? She said she wanted to meet us up here? I asked as we finally made it to the front of the pack of griffins. She'll be here soon. First, let's wait for Mom's announcement for the start of the celebration. Sin said. That's a great idea. I heard Vivrain said as she pushed through the crowd next to us. Hello, Shadow. Hello, Windthrasher. I smiled. Auntie Vervain, glad you made it. You look tired. Are you okay? I'll be fine, sweetheart. Just a long day, that's all. I just finished up with the last of today's work and rushed right over. Well, after I found something nice to wear. She said, indicating a simple violet dress that matched her eyes. I was about to say something when Gigi cleared her throat, then moved closer to the microphone that was set on the stage. Thank you all for being here tonight. As you know, tonight marks the 160th year of the Rebirth Celebration. As in years past, as marked down by the Griffin, who first started this celebration, today and the following day are two days. The rules of the Red Talons will be hidden away. This does not mean that the Red Talons can outright break our laws, but some things can be looked over for the last next 72 hours. The important thing about the laws being hidden in darkness is that all banished griffins from our lands may return to either see family, friends, or try and rejoin us. Also, griffins from other talent companies are allowed in Crimson Canyon as well, and if any griffin wants to join our ranks, they may, if they can prove themselves in battle. A lot of griffins around started to cheer. With that said, let me add that even though we are overlooking some rules and laws, that does not mean that we will tolerate murder, theft, rape, or assault. Any griffin or pony that does not follow these rules will be executed on the spot by myself or Apollo. Now, as you all know, I am Gillian Blood Talon, leader of the Red Talons. I welcome you all to my home and hope that you all enjoy your time here. So, without further ado... I declare the Rebirth Celebration officially started. As a special surprise for you all, this year's opening entertainment will be different. More griffins started to cheer. As I did, I looked back at Sin, asking, Where's Aura? Shouldn't she be here for this? Sin just smiled. Don't worry, Shadow. She's already here. What do you mean? I started to say, but Gigi's voice echoed throughout the canyon again. Most of our year's opening celebrations would be either a story of our past from Tonto, or a performance of strength and skill from our younger griffins. This year I had a request to do something else. This year you all will witness something that hasn't happened in Crimson Canyon for almost a decade. My three youngest daughters will be putting on a show for all of you. 
So please give a round of applause for Vavridian, Fletch, and Aura Blood Talon, Gigi said as each griffin walked onto the stage from the other side. My eyes got big as I looked at them all. Each one had on an outfit like none I'd ever seen on a griffin or pony. All three were wearing a tight-fitting skirt and loose-cut sleeves running along their forelegs, making the cut parts look like ribbons flowing to the ground. They also had on headbands, pulling back their head feathers. On their rear paws, I saw some kind of sleeves or socks, but their paws were poking through the bottom. On their slightly open wings, long tassels had been tied along them. Aura's outfit was a brilliant icy blue to match her eyes. V's was a dark pink, and Fletch's was a brilliant emerald green. I couldn't take my eyes off Aura. She looked more beautiful than I'd ever seen her before. I'm not sure if it was from the outfit or just because of how happy she looked. The Griffins fell silent as all three walked up to the microphones that had been put on stage. Aura was in between her sisters. She moved her beak closer to the microphone, saying into it, Hello, everyone. It's been a long time since the three of us all sang for you. V said into hers, Damn right it has. What do you say we show Crimson Canyon what the blood talon sisters still know how to party? Fletch laughed. Oh yeah, let's do it. The griffins from the rad talons cheered louder as the lights around the canyon started to dim, and all three sisters hung their heads. While I watched them, a band made its way onto the stage, the pony and two griffins playing the instruments. As the cheers started to die down I and fell quiet on the canyon, a deep boom filled the air as the music started, a slow and steady beat reverberating around the walls of the canyon. The drum's beat continued as the griffin playing it started to tap on a cymbal to match each deep thrum. Next, the pony standing next to his instrument added along another bass like thumb. Then the other griffin, who was standing on his hind legs, ran his talons up the guitar he was holding as his other talon came down to bring a beautiful strumming note to mix in with the others. Together, all three started to play a song. As they did, Aura brought her beak to the mic and started to sing. My first thought was that the voice coming out of her wasn't that of the griffin that I loved. When Aura spoke, she had a hard edge to her voice that rasped a little. When she sang, her voice didn't rasp. It was beautiful. Aura sang as her sisters hummed into their microphones. Then Fletch started, her voice just as beautiful as her sister's. She continued from where Aura left off, in the song speaking about a griffin who's lost in a sea of darkness and pain. V took up after Fletch, singing about the griffin wading through the darkness to find the light in her one true love, the soul she's meant to be with. Then all three joined their voices together and the music got faster. I noticed that the griffins around me had moved away from the stage and were starting to dance. Then, as the song came to an end, Aura said, All right, let's turn it up! The music got faster and a lot louder as the lights around the canyon blazed brighter. I felt Sin take hold of my hoof, pulling me away from the stage. I looked up at her as she laughed, saying, Don't just stand there. This is a party. I couldn't help laughing as well. I started to bob my head to the beat, moving my hooves and swaying my body. I twisted around and just let my body do what it wanted. I didn't care if anyone was watching. I didn't care if I was good at this or not. I didn't care about anything as long as I could just be carefree for once in my life. As time went on, the songs continued. I found myself laughing with griffins I'd never met, dancing with Stardust, dancing with Ravain. I even found myself being spun around by one of Fletch's minions, Groger. He was a really good dance partner. We danced through two and a half songs and a third before Eris cut in. I was a little surprised at first, but she smiled and said, It's a party, right? I don't see how any good can come of the dancer of the pony that Aura likes so much. Okay, just try and keep up, I said as I twisted around her body back and forth as she kept in step with me. The night went on, and after two more dances with Eris, I was starting to run out of breath. So when the song finished, I excused myself and walked over to Stardust who was sitting next to Wind Thrasher, just away from the dancing horde of griffins. He saw me coming over and held up a bottle of Applebuck rum. Want a drink? Sure, why not? A few sips can't hurt. 
I said as I took the bottle and drank a couple of mouthfuls, then winced. This stuff is nasty! How do you drink this? He shrugged as he took the bottle away from me, then passed it back to Windthrasher. Windthrasher seems to like it, and is my favorite liquor. If I had my saddlebags with me, I would have pulled out a bottle of Wild Pegasus, but sadly, I didn't. Maybe it's a Pegasus thing. I noticed that Windthrasher was looking a little drunk already. Is... she okay? Windthrasher looked over at me with a dreamy expression, and hiccuped. I... I is fine. I can... something. Then she looked over at Stardust. You have pretty eyes. Both of you. Either she's talking about both of us, or she's seeing two Stardusts. I think she's had enough. Stardust chuckled. She's only had five sips or so. She's a big lightweight. When Thrasher's eyes then went wide as she glared at Stardust. At least, I think she was looking at him. Did, did you call me fat? No, Pisage, you're a lightweight. It means that you can't handle your liquor, he said, taking a sip from the bottle. I, on the other hoof, can. I can drink as much as you. Windthrasher slurred, taking the bottle away from him and drowning more. Windthrasher, you've had enough, I said, pulling the bottle away from her with my magic. She hissed. Oh, he's mine. Not anymore, I said as I held the bottle up high. I want. She lunged at me, tipped over her own hooves, then fell flat on her belly and didn't get back up. Stardust looked worried. Wind Thresher, are you okay? I moved closer to the bat pony, right as she said quietly, The world is spinny. Whee. What do we do now? Stardust asked. I shrugged as Windthresher said, It's all about the pink bombs and weasels. Well, at least the time I understood her, though I don't have any idea what that means. I said, trying not to laugh at my drunk friend. For the goddess's sake, Shadow, please don't tell me you let Windthrasher get drunk, I heard Vervain say from behind me. Turning around, I saw her walking towards us. I pointed a hoof at Stardust. It was him! I took the rum away from her! She ignored me and walked over to Windthrasher, helping her up. Come on, sweetie, let's get you to bed. Windthrasher swayed a little. I'm... I'm fine. Then she belched. No, you're drunk. From the looks of your body, doesn't handle alcohol very well. Come on, I'll help you out. Vervain said, then looking over at Stardust. You're coming too. This is your fault. But I didn't want to. I didn't know she'd get drunk so easily. Stardust complained. Mervain glared at him. Come with me and help, or you can deal with me later. Right as she said this, Windthresher turned away from them both and threw up. She swayed and smiled. I feel better. Then she passed out. Mervain caught her, sighing. Come on, Stardust, help me get her back to the cave, please. He sighed. Yes, ma'am. Stardust picked her up and put her on his back. I just hope she doesn't hurl on me. As they started to walk away, Vervain said, If she does, then that's what you get for letting a mare like her get drunk. I watched them go, still trying to hold back a chuckle. Then looked over at the mess, Windthrasher left, and shivered. Gross. I think I'll go back to the party. I started walking back, but stopped a little way away as Zora and her sisters finished one last song. It was a slow song, and griffins were dancing slowly back and forth. I didn't feel right joining them. The song was for couples, and seeing how the griffin I loved was on stage, I had no one to dance with. I wondered to myself if Gigi was dancing with Apollo. And then I saw her next to the stage, standing with Sin, watching the rest of the griffins. I wonder where Apollo is, I said to myself, looking around for him. It only took me a moment to notice him. He was walking towards the west entrance of the Crimson Canyon, the same one we first used to first come here. Before he walked into the narrow entrance, he looked behind him to make sure no one was following him. Then he continued on. 
What could you be up to? I wondered to myself. Something about the way he was acting felt off. So I followed. I teleported past the rest of the griffins who were still dancing and ran to the west entrance. From what Aura told me when we first came to the canyon, this entrance wasn't used much since no pony lived on the side of the canyon. Keeping as quiet as I could, I slowly made my way down to the narrow passage, keeping an eye out for Apollo. It didn't take me long to find him. He was just down the way and around a bend in the rocky passage. He wasn't alone. I hid myself behind a rock, as Apollo said quietly. I told you to wait until tomorrow night or the next day. If Gillian sees you here, everything we've been planning will go to shit. Whoever he was talking to, their voices were hard to make out. As if her face was covered by something. But it sounded familiar. I just couldn't put my hoof on it. I don't care. What does it matter if we show up today or tomorrow? She can't do anything during the research celebration. You know that. Apollo raised his voice. It matters because I need to finish up on my end. Gillian will be hot enough to take care of in two days when we're ready. If we move in now, it won't work out in our favor. You know how hard it is to hide things from her. She's not a stupid griffin. I'm tired of waiting, Apollo, the other voice said, sounding irritated. You have your orders. Do you really want to disobey me now? Apollo retorted. No. Fine. I guess I can wait another day or two, if we have to. But that's all. You better have everything ready then. If not, we won't wait any longer. The voice said. What the hell are they talking about? Was Apollo planning on doing something? It sounded like it, but what could it be? I wanted to turn and head back so I could talk to Gigi, but when I moved, my hoof slid on the sandy ground. A small scratching noise echoed off the red sandstone, and I heard Apollo say, Get out of here now. I'll contact you tomorrow. Fuck. They heard me. I was about to teleport away, but I wasn't fast enough. Apollo rounded the corner and slammed me against the rocky wall. Who the hell? Oh, Shadow, it's you. He set me down. My apologies. I thought someone was trying to sneak up on me. My body was shaking at how fast he moved, and how powerfully he slammed me against the wall. Becking up, I said, What were you just talking about, and to whom? For a moment, he looked worried, then he chuckled. How much did you hear? Enough to know that you're planning something. I am. But from the look on your face, I'm guessing you think it's something bad. He said, still chuckling a little. Sounded like it from where I'm sitting. Shadow, it may have sounded bad, but I assure you it's not. You see, my wife's birthday is on the same day as the last day of the rebirth celebration, and I'm planning on surprising her with something. She never gets to enjoy her birthday, and I want this one to be special for her. I wasn't sure why, but it sounded like he was lying. So I pushed on. Then who was the other voice I heard? Sounded like a griffin I've met before, but it was hard to make out. Oh, she's just one of the griffins I use to send messages to some factions we have contact with. She's the one getting things set up for Gigi's birthday. It's so hard to surprise her, Impala said. If that's so, then why did she say we don't want to wait any longer? What are you planning? I asked. Keep my magic held just in case I needed to use a spell. Calm yourself, Shadow, Apollo said, noticing my glowing horn. Like I said, it's a big surprise. My griffin and her wing are good friends of Gigi's as well, and they don't want to wait longer to give my wife her gift. They've been planning this for a while now, and the suspense is getting to us all. What am I doing? This is Apollo, or his dad. He's always been a kind griffin to me. Apart from that time, he tried to kill me for a fake contract. But that wasn't his fault. I guess being in the wasteland so long has made me paranoid. I sighed and let my magic fade away. I'm sorry. I just thought something was going on, and the way you were talking with her, I thought you were planning on doing something to Gigi. He laughed. <laughs> it's quite all right, Shadow. I understand. You have good instincts. If you were born a griffin, you would have made a good talon. I can see what my daughter sees in you. Well, 
Everything is just fine. Don't worry. Okay. Sorry I followed you. He patted the top of my head and started to head back towards Crimson Canyon. He stopped, then turned back to me. Oh, and can you keep this between you and me? I don't want to ruin the surprise. I nodded. Sure thing, Apollo. I smiled, but I noticed it looked forced, like he was trying to forget about something. Thank you. How about we head back to the party? It sounds like Aura and her sisters are finished. I'll be right there. Don't take too long. When he was gone, I turned back towards where he was talking to the other griffin and walked over to the place. I didn't know what I was expecting to find or to learn, but something about the conversation and the way he attacked me wasn't sitting right. At first, when I looked around, nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. I took a few minutes to look around, but there wasn't anything else to see. I turned to head back to the party, and a speck of color caught my eye. Looking over to a rock that sat next to the cliff, I saw a something red lying there, almost out of sight. Walking over to it, I picked it up with my magic. It was a small fire-red griffin's feather. Gina? I wondered to myself. Well, then I thought about it. That couldn't have been her. Apollo, out of any griffin, wouldn't have been talking to Gigi's sister. She was the one who killed Gale, the griffin Apollo had been in love with. That's what Orin said, at least. Still wondering who could have belonged to, and with a nagging suspicion in the back of my head, I put the feather into the folds of my dress and headed back to Crimson Canyon. I was just about to get out of the passage when Aura flew down and pulled me into a tight hug. There you are. Did you like the show? She sounded out of breath, but excited all the same. Smiling, I hugged her back, saying, It was a blast. I had no idea you could sing like that. Or at all. She blushed a little. Well, I used to sing with my sisters a lot when we were younger. That was until Fletch and I started having problems. Who would have thought we'd make up in such a strange way, and then put a performance on a few hours later? So, is that what you were thinking about doing on your way here? Putting out performance? She shrugged. Eh, kind of. I didn't think V or Fletch would be up for it. But I wanted to do something. It was my way of thanking Mom for talking with me and convincing me to come here for the celebration. Making up with Fletch was just a bonus. We had a good long talk in the den. I'm glad to hear it. So, do you want to head back to the cave? Wingnut and Bite are sleeping on our side of the bed. But I think we can manage if we cuddle. I said with a wink. She looked back at the cave entrance I'd just come from. Why were you down there? No reason. I just wanted to take a walk. Didn't even think about where I was going. I said, putting on a smile so she wouldn't think I was lying. She looked at me for a long moment and shrugged. Well, okay. To answer your question, I'd love to get some rest. Tomorrow we'll be up early. Knowing Mom or Dad, they'll have something for us to do, and it's always fun to watch the fights. I smiled and pulled myself onto her back. Now let's go, hon. She smiled and took to the air. Too bad the squirts are sleeping in our bed. After all their excitement, I'd love to relax in a more private way. But we really don't want to wake the kids up with something like that. I'm sure I could move them, I said, winking at her. She just laughed. Nope, you'll just have to wait till tomorrow now. That's the price we adults pay to when there's kids around. I huffed. Damn those two kids. Even in their sleep, they still find a way to fuck with me. Oh well, there's nothing I can do about it now. As Aura flew back to her cave, I pulled out the red feather I found and looked at it. I couldn't shake the feeling I was getting. Was I really being paranoid, or was something else going on I was choosing to ignore? Whatever it is, I have to figure it out before the last day of the celebration. I wasn't going to let something happen if I could help it. If I'm wrong, then at least it's better than the alternative. Footnote. Level up. New perk added. Dancing Queen. Has anyone ever told you that you're really fun at parties? No? Rude of them. Because the when you dance with your significant other, you gain a temporary 30-plus health boost for the next six hours. There's also the added bonus of getting to dance. <laughs>